Namaskar. Welcome to the first online Kashmir festival organized by Global Kashmiri Pandit Diaspora in association with I Am Buddha. I'm your host, Mohan Wanchi. Kashmir has faced centuries of slaughter of Kashmiri Pandits that has been unabated for the past six centuries, right from the 14th century. Century after century, invaders came into Kashmir and killed millions of Kashmiri Pandits. And their only fault was their food. As a result, millions of Kashmiri Pandits had to flee from Kashmir to save their lives. There have been seven exoduses of Kashmiri Pandits over the past centuries. To, this, to discuss this topic today, we have with us a distinguished panel of scholars, journalists, and social activists that will shed more light on the seven exoduses of Kashmiri Pandits, of which the most recent one of 1989 is staring in our face. Our today's distinguished panelists are Professor Padmashri K. N. Pandita. Professor Padmashri K. N. Pandita has a PhD from the University of Tehran in Iran in the field of Iranian Central Asian Studies. He has traveled extensively in all the Central Asian republics during and after the Soviet power and cultivated a large number of scholars and academics in the field of Central Asian studies. He has 10 books to his credit and the latest just on the stands is titled Kashmiri Pandits Through Fire and Brimstone. He is an awardee of the President of India for his services to Indo-Aryan civilization. He also won the Padma Shri Award from the President of India in 2017. As a human rights activist, he has been presenting the case of Kashmiri Pandits at the UN Human Rights Commission from 1991 to 2019, making interventions submitting written statements, interacting with NGOs, and engaging experts in community debates and discussions on South Asian issues and connected matters. It is truly an honor to have you on our panel, Professor Pandita. Our next distinguished panelist is Professor Satish Ganju. Professor Satish Ganju, has a PhD in modern chemistry, uh, modern history, I apologize, from the University of Kashmir. He has worked in Central University of Himachal Pradesh as chair, professor in the chair for tribal studies. Professor Ganju, an educationist by profession, a historian by obsession, and a researcher by choice, has published more than 21 books. Some of his widely acknowledged books include Kashmir Politics, The Islamic World, Kashmir History and Politics, and many more. Professor Ganju has been celebrated by many awards, like Rashtriya Gaurav Award, Best Citizen of India Award, Vijay Shri Award, Leading Educationist of India Award, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam Award, Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee Award, amongst many awards. Welcome to our panel, Professor Satish Ganji. Our next distinguished panelist is Ms. Asha Khosa. Ms. Asha Khosa was the lone woman to report terrorism and related events from Kashmir in the decades of 90s. A career journalist, Asha has worked with national newspapers like Indian Express and Business Standard and other media for over three decades. She has won several awards for her Kashmir reporting. In their respective books, General Krishna Rao and Lieutenant General Arjun Ray have mentioned her name for her daring and bold reporting during the peak of terrorism. She's currently working on her book on Kashmir. She lives in Delhi and is an independent writer. 
she works on she writes on digital portals on kashmir and pakistan welcome ms asha khos our next distinguished panelist is mr jeevan zuchi mr jeevan zuchi is a community activist and is the founding mem member of the california chapter of kashmiri overseas association which is also known as koa he is a founding mem member of iakf fia of northern california gopio silicon valley and indo american friendship council mr zuchi is the author of a non fiction the last smile the book is about a journey of hope the independent feature film the last smile has received numerous awards in various continents and is available on amazon prime and some other online platforms welcome mr jeevan zuchi so first of all on behalf of global kashmiri pandit diaspora and i am buddha i would like to welcome you all distinguished panelists to our session thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to participate in this panel in order to get a good understanding about the seven exoduses of kashmiri pandits it is important for us to get a chronological perspective so i'd like to turn to professor satish ganju who has written extensively on this subject uh, professor ganju you. you have witnessed the most recent exodus of kashmiri pandits and have written extensively on this topic from times in memorial invaders from middle east and central asia have attacked india and ruled us for almost a millennium the people of kashmir had to face a very very difficult decision of either to convert to islam or to leave kashmir or simply get killed can you please shed some more light on this very dark aspect of our history uh, please tell us how this all started and how the kashmiri pandits had no other alternatives but to flee their state professor satish uh, ganju thank you thank you very much so nice of you for your kind words uh, the seven exodus of kashmiri pandits this all started with when uh, sahadeva ruled kashmir in 1301 to 1320 uh, two immigrants i should say two refugees rinchan came from tibet and shahmir came from swat with the passage of time all these both these refugees manipulated things in their own interest uh, it was in 1320 around so this when rinchana became the king of kashmir by some foul means and after becoming the king he married the daughter of ramachandra who was the commander in chief of sahadeva uh, kota rani and he wanted to because he had come from tibet and he was a buddhist he wanted to convert to hinduism but hindus refused to welcome him in their fold so he had no choice but to become a muslim and he ruled for 3 years up to 1323 then there was shahmir shahmir was a was a um, was a diplomat in a type he was watching the event what will be happening in kashmir and he manipulated the things in his own interest he ruled he also became a king and ruled the kashmir and ruled kashmir from 1339 to 1342 this was the beginning of muslim rule in kashmir shahmir was a muslim he ruled kashmir and this was the beginning of muslim rule in kashmir and all of the dynasties it was 
Sikandar, Sikandar Book Chicken, who ruled Kashmir in 1389 to 1413, that all uh, uh, cruelties were inflicted on the Hindus. During this period, two, uh, two immigrants from Central Asia, um, Sayyid Ali Hamdani and his son Mir Muhammad Hamdani came to Kashmir. And they, their aim was to convert Kashmir into a Muslim state. And they tried every effort, they made every effort to change the very society and culture of Kashmir. And with the help of Sikandar, they managed the event in such a way that Hindus were given only three choices uh, to convert, to die, or to leave, to go into exile. And they, this was the first exodus of the Hindus of Kashmir during the reign of uh, Sultan Sikandar. Then after uh, Sultan Sikandar, his son Elisha became the ruler of Kashmir. He ruled from 1413 to 1424, six years only. He was, he followed the policy of his father, Sultan Sikandar, and, and inflicted every, inflicted every uh, torture on the Hindus of Kashmir that they had to fly, they had to leave Kashmir. This was their second exodus. And then it was during the time of Sultan Fatisha, Fatisha who ruled Kashmir in 1486 to 1493, that uh, the same torture was inflicted on the Kashmiri Hindus and they had to fled Kashmir for the third time. And these, all these things, after this were during the reign of Shahmir, Shahmir dynasty. Then came the Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb, the ruler of India, the Mughal ruler, who appointed his cruel governors in Kashmir and who inflicted every type of torture on the Hindus of Kashmir, that the Hindus had to seek the help from um, Guru. Take Bahadur. See, go to take Bahadur and to request him to save them, which resulted in the martyrdom of Guru Take Bahadur and the creation of Khalsa. This was their fourth exodus. And during the period of later Mughals, after Aurangzeb, same policy was applied to them, same approach, same. Mm, Hindus were same, given same treatment they, that mm, they fled for the fifth time. And it was during the reign of Afghans, when the Afghan rule began in Kashmir in 1753 to 1819, that every torture was inflicted on Kashmiri Hindus and they fled. They were killed, they were converted, they were, every torture was inflicted on them. And they had to, no option but fled Kashmir and this was their sixth exodus. And seventh, as you know, was in uh, 1919. Yes, um, it is, um, your narration of the facts, you know, sends chills down the spine, um, you know, how Kashmiri Pandits have endured the impossible. So can you tell us, you know, what the uh, lesson we have learned from this, uh, from this era of, uh, of all these um, exoduses? What we learned is that, that we have always tried to seek the help from others. We made the effort to, to stay with our values, to stay with our, we had to, face it ourselves. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> we have to face ourselves and now I think now we have become strong enough to face all this. We are the only community in the world that we have faced 
so many hardships, so, so many pressures from each and every uh, from each and every corner. We are we have become strong enough to face our this we are the strong for resilience. Mm -hmm. yeah, we have we have learned to struggle for resilience. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ganju, uh, you know, for uh, for giving us, uh, you know, a uh, a good um, rundown on all that we faced uh, over the centuries. And that leads us you know, to the most recent um, uh, exodus that we had, um, you know, in, in 1990. Yes, yes. And I would like to uh, turn to uh, Ms. Asha Khosa. Uh, Ms. Asha Kosa, we are delighted to have you on our panel. You are an eminent journalist and have spent so many years covering the Kashmiri genocide and exodus. Uh, the latest exodus uh, still has ghastly images of killings of Kashmiri pundits permanently etched in our minds. Um, can you please share your thoughts on how things were in 1989 uh, you know, during this uh, most recent uh, exodus of Kashmiri pundits, when uh, they again left in droves, you know, from uh, from the Kashmir Valley. Thank you so much, Mr. Vanchu, for having me here. Um, I I happen to be exactly in Kashmir as a journalist at the in eight, 1989. I reached there and uh, events up to 1999. Uh, you know, full decade I was there, and that was the, I guess, the most turbulent decade from all angles: the violence, the the exodus, the displacement of Kashmiri Pandit, the killings of genocide. Uh, I have I have seen it all, and I have seen it as a. I I can claim that I was a stakeholder. I'm a Kashmiri Pandit. I was a stakeholder, but at the same time, I had to use uh, my training. I am an objective person, so I see things in uh, objectively because I'm a journalist. I have to report to the entire world. So uh, things, uh, as many of you know, were very very bad, and things started changing overnight. You know, one day I was standing on the roadside. I had to go to my house, my aunt's house in Ali Kadal, and I can't move because there are lakhs of people on the road and chanting slogans. And I had to seek refuge in a in a in a you know hotel. Uh, a Muslim colleague was with me. He said it's not safe for you to go. People were mad. I mean, after that, uh, the Kashmiri Pandit um, killings began the ib uh, officers there were targeted killings some of my relatives mr um, a very senior advocate uh, from anant nag mr bhat um, he, was, he happened to be my relative he was killed in the broad daylight and so many other people were killed it happened but i can tell you uh, there was not nobody was uh, talking about them in kashmir if you tell them oh my relative has been killed you know, I would speak with my Muslim colleagues. I'll say, oh, you know, I have to go to Anantnag. My sister's father-in-law has been killed. He was killed on the roadside. He used to host parties for his Muslim colleagues. And uh, he has been killed now. And they would say, uh, um, you know, there was total callousness. They thought their tragedy or their, uh, their, their movement, they used to call it, uh, Tahrik, Tahrik, they used to call it. Their movement is much bigger than killing of one person. There was no empathy from common people. They didn't bother about them. They were neither happy nor they were sad about such killings. They never thought that something big is happening. One was that. I've seen all. I've seen the Nandi Mar killing. I've seen the you know those massacres um, in far off places. I have visited those places. There was only one survivor in some cases. Those kind of things. But there are a few observations I have made about this, our behavior as individuals, as community, and what went wrong. I'll just share with all of you here. First of all, uh, I think the threat was very open as I, as a journalist, gathered. Uh, I mean, people were telling them, 
you know i i have instances of my own friends relatives who were you know constructing their houses or repairing their houses and their mason will say oh let me choose the tiles you know you don't have to live here i have to live here let me choose tiles of my and they laughed it off they said ah it's a joke and they knew somewhere deep in their mind they knew there is something brewing up and yet we fail to recognize it we fail to acknowledge it one secondly when pani sar ke upar ud gaya you know the the january uh, exodus when it began uh, at that time we all acted as individuals i i know people you know brother didn't tell his brother who were living in the same house that i am leaving or fleeing overnight because i have a threat to my life and next morning they are getting up and say oh sukot gav sukot gav suchun kuni he has reached jammu uh, we fail to act even as families we fail to act we fail to act as a community uh, i think i think we we a friend of mine who is a non kashmiri he knows kashmir in and out he says you are a bunch of individuals you are not a community i hope we prove him wrong one day but that was his observation he said how can you let such a thing how can you let your land go and not you know discuss it with your family that happened thirdly the worst thing to happen was uh, while professor satish ganju was talking about eras which were uh, basically you know it was monarchy a king used to rule and he used to convert his subjects to the religion he followed that was the general norm in many parts of the world at least in this part of the world and there were struggles you know some people would convert some wouldn't convert we know it all though it was not justified but today we are living in a secular polity mm-hmm. how can religion play out how can we allow the religion to play out so brazenly it was so brazen i mean i as a journalist would be walking on the road i never wear any sign of religion you know as a normal you know wearing a jeans and shirt and a dup- i would be told it's uh, where is your bindi it's kya chak but chak ke no musliman chak a vendor you know i went to buy some fruit from a person he asked me young fellow i gave him a befitting reply but i was terrified inside i went to the shop and bought a dupatta and put it on my head so it was happening in a uh, in a polity which is secular and that is the shame for india that is shame for all kashmiris how could that happen and we must hold the ruler of that time responsible for it dr farooq abdullah very very conveniently wo dum dabha ke bhag gaye he just left us alone to struggle to to survive and he would blame us he he never you know felt responsible towards us i also feel that we don't we never enjoyed political clout with anybody in kashmir we were not present in any of the political parties not that they were very safe but nobody spoke about us that was the worst part at that time you know nobody will talk about our killing our exodus and they'll say ha ha they have gone i am talking from kashmir's perspective they say oh they have gone there they are getting all bata they are getting all you know uh, paisa mil raha hai unko they are living a uh, luxurious life that was the narrative in kashmir and that is a narrative with which the young people of kashmir you know sons and daughters of uh, people who were adult that that time they have grown up with so one was that another point that i i think uh, what happened and what i felt very bad looking from kashmir was any time a kashmiri pandit professional or a common man will be killed the people living outside they never protested in the manner they should have protested they should have shaken the india because they were living in india which was not like kashmir you know they should have shaken up the example i'll give you um, uh, the doodashan director he was Lassa killed lassa kolsa was killed and if you listen to the story uh, there was not even a priest to carry uh, his uh, you know uh, carry out his um, last rites a priest had to be brought from the army and the, uh, there was a army colonel who was in mi uh, he was from south he told me what a shame for you you are a kashmiri pandit community you don't have a pandit here 
we have to get it from army what he was trying to taunt me is that you people uh, are not together you are not courageous enough to stay put here I have the distinct honor of turning to Padma Shri Professor K N Pandita, who has been doing pioneering work on bringing the plight of Kashmiri Pandits to the forums in United Nations, the United Kingdom Parliament, and the European Parliament. Padma Shri Professor K N Pandita, it is my honor to have you on this panel to be speaking with you. There has been a constant effort. by the indian government to downplay the pain and suffering of kashmiri pandits during and after this genocide as a result the international community has not received an accurate account of the genocide uh, can you please tell us about your efforts in this area to bring awareness in international circles towards this genocide uh, thank you monji uh first of all i must uh, thank the uh, for arranging this uh, webinar and along with this other activities also in the united states and elsewhere it's very commendable job you are doing and we are proud of you now about kashmir issue at the united nations human rights commission in geneva I first went to Geneva in 1991. You must remember that the Kashmir insurgency was sponsored by Pakistan. Actually, the original scheme. called operation to pack was initiated by general ziaul haq and the entire blueprint of that insurgency was drawn by him uh, he passed away in that accident but the entire scheme was taken over by isi and isi began working on kashmir insurgency or forcible occupation of kashmir as early as june 3 1947 that's at least several months ahead of the transfer of power on 15th of august we have detailed report of what activities were undertaken by the northwest frontier chief minister kayum khan and the british governor of northwest frontier town of how they were going to uh, proceed in this case of invasion of of kashmir in 1947 uh in the top pack my uh, mission of pakistan had several aspects it was not only one aspect and one of the most important aspects with which we are concerned and i my speech is concerned is the massive disinformation by isi on what was happening in kashmir what they were plan planning in 1989 and 1990 when i arrived in geneva in 1991 i was surprised to find that a massive disinformation campaign had already been launched by isi and pakistani workers activists who had roped in kashmiri muslims the then activists of jamaat-e-islami 
Three of them were very prominent. One is Gulam Nabi Fai, who is now still in USA, and you know, most of you know him very well. The other person was uh, Ayub Thakur. He is no more. He is, she was based in London. And the third person was Safvi, who is now holding an important position in the United Front uh, with, with, base, with its base at Muzaffarabad and Rawalpindi. The campaign and this information campaign was to the extent that almost all NGOs, major NGOs, and there were several hundreds of them, and the maximum number of delegates from countries, of 53 countries, they all of them had been brainwashed by Pakistan by supplying them tons of material, all fake, all fictitious. It was a huge effort on the part of ISI to publish that material in fine print, in glaze, on glazed paper, with most of the pictures all fake. So much so that international NGOs like Amnesty International were duped, they were misled, and they would publish photographs with subtitles, Indian soldiers torturing the Kashmiris. You see, they had, the Pakistan and ISI, they had been planning on it for months together. And the best brains were inducted into this planning. I found that our intelligence persons were totally ignorant of what was happening months ahead of the rise, uh, eruption of insurgency. They had no idea, absolutely no idea. So for me, the question was how to profile our plight when there is a disinformation campaign. And whatever I say, people refute it. They say, no, Indian army has unleashed terror in Kashmir. The Kashmiris are fighting a freedom fight. There are, there, there are uh, freedom fighters from Punj, Bagh, Kotli, others. They are all Kashmiris. They are from Kashmir. They are not from Pakistan. None, nobody has gone from Pakistan. So, for me, for us, the, it was a double-pronged double, uh, attack, I found it. One was the disinformation, and the second was to contradict whatever we would say. So under these circumstances, I can say that uh, at that time, I think I was the only, only, mine was the only NGO, I and a couple of more people were there. Who no NGO, the propaganda, anti-India propaganda was to the extent that no NGO in Geneva was prepared to give me platform. No NGO. Oh, this, they would ask me, what are you going to say? I said about Kashmir, about the attack on the minority, about the killing, murder, genocide, extirpation of the minorities. No, no. No, no, we're not going to give you a platform for that. So I wouldn't get even the platform. And the Indian mission never cared to come to my rescue, to guide me, or to help me in finding a platform. On the other hand, the Pakistani intelligence agencies, ISI, they would manage at least half a dozen platforms for their people. And they would speak from different platforms, speaking the same thing, but from different platforms. So thereby, in, in this way, 
they, uh, they, they indoctrinated the entire house, entire uh, human rights uh, council at that time. Now, under these circumstances, it became very difficult even to, to me interact with the people outside the session. Going inside the session was not at all possible, but even outside the session it was difficult for me. Finally, uh, an African NGO came to my rescue. I managed to approach an African NGO chief. His name was Samura. He asked me, "What, pro Professor, what are you going to speak about? I said, about the refugees, about the, about the internally displaced persons. How many of them? I said, that we are nearly four wrecks. He said, look, my friend, we have 40 lakhs of internally displaced people in African countries, and I'm representing them. So I have a very big job to do. I told him, OK, add four more lakhs to your quantum, quantum of refugees. So he was really kind to me, and he gave me the platform for the first time. And when I made an intervention, my first intervention, these Pakis, their stooges, the Kashmiris, they all were mad with Samura. Why did you allow him the platform? So that was the situation. That was the, uh, that was the atmosphere in Geneva at the time. I sought interview with the secretary. And I wanted to tell him that here was a large disinformation campaign. And this was not the truth. The secretary was not prepared to listen to me at all. He said, you say, you go and make an intervention, or you give a written statement, whatever you have to say. There can be no personal communication. While at the same time, day in and day out, he would meet the delegation from, Siri, uh, from the Muslims of Srinagar and from POK and interact with them. Uh, when I look at retrospect, there are so many things to be told. But I wonder why the Indian government at that time, and that was the Congress government, why did they not envisage this situation? Why did they not take corrective measures how they could counter the campaign of Pakistan, how they could support and bring in their NGOs who are well-educated, well-informed, well-articulated? I was just wondering. Personally speaking, I never received any support from them, any encouragement from them. And in a sense, there was discouragement, not encouragement. Though I didn't get that, I, I was not discouraged really, because I began to understand things by and by. Uh, two things I have been able to, after, after my long effort at uh, Geneva Human Rights Council or Human Rights Commission. First it was Commission, now it's Council. I have been able to do two things, and I'm very happy about that. That my long struggle did yield two positive results. Number one, I made it clear in the working group of Human Rights Commission, working group on minorities, that we were not migrants, but internally displaced persons. This was argued for a long time, at least for two years. They discussed it, they debated it. I made interventions, I made presentations, statements, and finally they agreed. And in the United Nations documentation, 
we Kashmiri Pandits are always referred as internally displaced persons. Though we approached government of India and we approached the Human Rights National Human Rights Commission to recognize us after United Nations Human Rights Commission as internally displaced persons, but they did not recognize us. And that's a different story. That's one thing which we could achieve. Today, if you look at the, at the documents of United Nations pertaining to Kashmir and pertaining to the Pandits, you'll find they have written their internally displaced persons. Second thing which we could do was, uh, I raised an issue in the minority group of Human Rights Commission about our status. I asked them that Kashmir is run by Article 370. And Kashmir has its own constitution, JNK has its own constitution, which does not recognize any community as a minority community. But the Muslims are number one minority community, uh, community in the Indian Union, according to the Constitution of India. Now, in Kashmir, a Muslim is a member of minority community, community on national level, but a majority community on local level, on regional level. So he has best of both the worlds. He eats the cake as well as he has it. But we Kashmiri Pandits, whenever we ask for our rights, special rights, our status as minority, we were told that you belong to the majority community of India. <coughs> so you don't have, you have the rights, government of India gives rights to everybody, that those rights accrue to you. And since you, we don't have in our constitution a minority community, we don't recognize you as a minor, religious minority. So this question was debated for three years at the working group of minorities in Geneva. And finally, they found a way out. They added one more definition to the minority, and it was the reverse minority, as then they have written in that, in that uh, resolution, as in Kashmiri Pandits in India. That means a community which is a majority, which has a majority status on national level, but has a minority status on regional level. In pursuance of that resolution, I moved a motion here among my friends. We formed the committee, and Professor Muju was uh, secretary of that committee. And we passed a resolution. We sent letters to the chief minister and the National Humor and National Minority Commission chairman in, in New Delhi sending him a copy of the resolution of United Nations Human Rights Commission and demanding that we be declared a minority. The fact is that, and people don't know, the fact is that the national, uh, the chairman of National Minority Commission wrote letters, one letter to Farooq Abdullah and another to Mr. Advani, who was the Home Minister. They wrote to them to recognize Kashmiri Pandits as a minority. But uh, uh, Advani declined to accept us as minority. So even up this time, we have not been recognized as a minority. United Nations Human Rights Commission has, not, has never been convinced the, the fact is that it never got convinced that 
the pundits were subjected to genocide, subjected to extirpation, and subjected to persecution in Gentile state. They never accepted it. But ultimately, it was only after 9-11 that there, there began some rethinking among some of the members, and they began to to, to bring into consideration the activities of the fundamentalist terrorists, which we had been speaking uh, so often in our interventions. Sure, sure. I remember that when the pilgrims to Amarnath, some pilgrims were killed by the terrorists way back in, in 1997, 98, I made an intervention. And I brought this issue before the commission. And I said in one, my, in one sentence, I said the last concluding sentence of my intervention was, Mr. Chairman, the pilgrims are messengers of peace everywhere. They don't deserve bullets. This sentence became very famous throughout the, 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 the body. And then, there was a great response to that. From that time onwards, people began to respond to my And I remember that when I would make interventions, I had to print at least 200 copies of my speech, and people would take them immediately, like hot, hot cakes, it would be distributed among the members. Yes. The trend began to change after the international perception of fundamentalism and terrorism was highlighted, not by us, we tried, we didn't succeed, but the European uh, countries, European members uh, of, the, uh, of the commission and others. So, uh, Professor Pandita, thank you so much for you know, giving us uh, so much information on uh, on your activities uh, at the United Nations, um, thank you for for exposing these uh, ghastly acts, you know, to the international community. Uh, it's not surprising that the international community, as you mentioned, has not been so forthcoming to take appropriate steps to handle this subject. I know. In the most uh, in the most recent exodus of 1989, more than half a million people had to run away from Kashmir to save their lives. And unfortunately, more than 2,000 of them were brutally slaughtered and murdered at the hands of the Islamists. Uh, as you said, there's a uh, you know, effort on part of several people uh, to have the Indian government call a spade a spade and call this a genocide instead of you know, window dressing it as a migration and all the other terms you know, that they've given us. Uh, in your opinion, what needs to happen so that the government of India calls this a genocide and does not call it a migration? Uh, you see, our issue as such has been politicized. The the, the, the crisis which we faced and the trauma through which we had to go has been politicized, especially by the Congress government. Their concerns, concern was to project India as a secular country and to treat Kashmir issue as an aberration, small aberration, which had no depth at all. This is what they wanted to do. And anybody like myself trying to expose Kashmir majority community was unwanted. He was an unwanted person. And that is the reason why there has been confusion was confounded about Kashmir issue as a whole and that of Kashmiri Pandits as a whole. 
Imagine four lakh people, four hundred thousand people who are the inheritors of nearly six thousand years of history and civilization have been uprooted from their homes and hearts and no Indian paper worth the name raised the issue in its proper format, in proper perspective. We had to fight not only our adversaries, either in Kashmir or in Pakistan, but our adversaries within India and especially in the media. Sure, sure. I don't have time. Otherwise, I will give you a graphic picture of what malevolent, what vicious role Indian media has played and has been playing even today. Kuldeep Nair and so many other people. Sure, sure. We oh. should we should not blame only the Kashmiris, the, the Kashmir press, Urdu press, whatever it is. Yes. But Give me a single, give me one, any one paper who has analyzed the whole issue of Kashmiri Pandits, who has given the history of Kashmiri Pandits and what we have suffered in 19, I say in 1947, handing over the state, taking, taking away the state from a benign autocrat to a rabid fanatic and giving it to the rabid fanatic. It was something like writing, signing our death warrant. Yes. We knew what had happened in 1947 when, uh, <coughs> uh, when uh, our leaders approached New Delhi and told them, look, you have some, you have some basic fundamental principle in allowing Article 370 into the Indian Constitution. Why yes. don't you apply the same theme and same principle to Kashmir Pandits? Thank you so much, Professor Pandita. Um, Thank you very much. For giving us you know, uh, a very good insight into, uh, into what has been happening in international circles and why the Indian press you know, has been so soft and, uh, and not you know, brought this uh, to, to the people's attention. We'd like to move to uh, Mr. Jeevan Zuchi, if you, you know, if you uh, allow us. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Zuchi, for joining our panel. Uh, we are honored, you know, by the extensive community service work uh, you have done for the Kashmiri community here in the U.S. Uh, as our distinguished panelists have related, there has been so many exodices of Kashmiri pundits over the centuries. Uh, a lot of water has passed under the bridge and uh, for quite a long time. Uh, we would love to hear your thoughts on where we are today vis-a-vis -vis these exoduses and where do we go from here? Uh, over to you, Mr. Uh, Jeevan Zuchi. Uh, thank you very much once again. And right now, after listening to our Padam Shri uh, uh, Pantasa, I was reminded of uh, 1992 and it was the same month well it was 15th november 1992 when we had the honor of having him as a keynote speaker and the chief guest was uh, uh, balraj madok and uh, i convened a symposium here on human rights uh, i remember uh, mr kane penta's speech was as powerful as it is today and it won the hearts of two congressmen who were with us in that symposium. And it really actually paved our way for our activism because uh, of what he said and what was done in that symposium. Uh, but thank you again. Uh, you know, I will probably repeat uh, some of the things which have been already said and I'm in no position to say what really Mr. Panta and uh, our historian Ganju Saab has already said. Uh, I, I'll just recapitulate a few things here because it will help us uh, pave a path for the future. Now, ancient Kashmir was home to a majority 
Hindu and Buddhist population for thousands of years, as we know, and a renowned center for Hindu and Buddhist learning. Islamic invaders from Central Asia took control in the 14th century. Under Islamic rule, Hindus faced periods of persecution, as Mr. Ganju was just talking about, which resulted in mass migrations from the region roughly once a century until the late 1700s. In the early 1800s, Sikh rulers controlled the region, followed by a Hindu dynasty from the mid 1800s through 1947. When the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir became part of the Republic of India, shortly thereafter, Pakistani armed forces and Pashtun tribesmen invaded the area, forcing the largest Kashmiri political party to approve the accession. Indian forces were deployed to counter the attacks by Pakistan. Pakistan's proxy war in Kashmir began in 1989. An insurgency sponsored by Pakistan's military and intelligence service engulfed the Kashmir Valley. The ISI supported jihad in Kashmir was rooted in the ideology of Pakistani Islamists, carefully nurtured for decades by the Pakistani military as uh, uh, Mr. Panta just mentioned, the ISI. And the beautiful valley of Kashmir became a bed of Islamic terrorism, as we know, and the campaign of intimidation and harassment worsened in the late 80s with growing influence of the straight-laced interpretation of Islam propagated through Wahhabism. To completely Islamize Kashmir, Pakistan was able to capitalize on this by financing, arming, and training militant groups across the border and ethnic cleansing of the Kashmiri Pandits was undertaken on January 19, 1990. Many secular Muslims and intellectuals who did not become part of this campaign were also killed. Between 1989 and 91, over 350,000 Kashmiri Pandits were ethnically cleansed from the valley which is over 95% of the valley's indigenous Hindu population in a campaign of targeted killings, rape, threats, destruction of properties and religious sites. Our people were killed, women tortured and raped, and some men had their eyes pulled out and their body hung on a tree. For the last, for the past 30 years, thousands of displaced pundits have lived in camps in Jammu and New Delhi while successive governments have failed to safely rehabilitate them to the value. Now, in August last year, the Indian government legally and democratically abrogated Article 370 and 35A of India's constitution, temporary provisions that conferred special status on the state of Jammu and Kashmir. The move sought to better integrate the residents of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh into the rest of India, ensuring that they enjoy equal protection under the law and all the rights afforded other Indian citizens, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, religion, or social class, and have access to better educational and economic opportunities. It's also expected to create conditions for the rehabilitation and resettlement of Kashmiri Pandits in the Kashmir Valley. At the same time, Jammu and Kashmir was bifurcated into two new union territories, one for Jammu and Kashmir and one for Ladakh. Kashmir, a way forward, after Articles 370 and 35A of Indian Constitution have been abrogated now, the future of Kashmir has brightened and we can see many changes have already taken place which are related to Kashmiri women, rather women who married someone from outside the state were discriminated against, being barred from passing property on to their children. Now they will not be penalized for marrying someone from another state. Women in Kashmir now have protection against domestic violence. They now are protected against automatic divorce or triple talaq. Kashmiri members of scheduled caste have now access to a number of affirmative action programs for educational, economic, and political opportunity. 
Under Indian law, children under the age of 14 have a right to education. It's also illegal to marry children until the abrogation of Article 370, 35A, Kashmiri children did not enjoy this right, nor were they protected against child marriage. Under 35A, the indigenous Kashmiri Pandit population, after being ethnically cleansed from the state in 1989-1990, was stripped of their permanent residency with no way of gaining it back. This cemented into law a massive demographic shift in the state, reducing the Hindu population of the region to a minuscule fraction of what it had been prior to the largest ethnic cleansing that occurred nearly 30 years ago. Thanks to the abrogation of Article 370-35A, that Kashmiri Pandit finally have hopes of returning to their homes. Under Indian law, it is not illegal to gay until the abrogation of Article 370-35A. These laws did not apply to Kashmiri gay and lesbian individuals. The first phase of the eight-phased election, marking the first democratic exercise in Jammu and Kashmir after abrogation of Article 370 and bifurcation of the Jammu and Kashmir state into two union territories last year, was held just last week uh, on November 28th. And uh, there were nearly 52% electorate exercising their franchise in both divisions. The third phase of district development council elections in Jammu and Kashmir it just happened on Friday, a uh, couple of days back, and it saw a voter turnout of more than 50%. A large number of people have come out to cast their votes during this phase. Polling has been very peaceful by and large. As we see now, the past 72 years will now guide us to make our future very bright. Thank you, Mr. Vanj. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving us you know, a, a good run around and a bird's eye view of, uh, of what you know, has been happening. Um, you know, uh, we, we have fought this war uh, you know, uh, with the pen, but never you know, picked up the gun. Um, how, Mr. Zuchi, do you think you know, we can reinvent ourselves to prevent the next exodus if it happens, if any? <laughs> you know, power of pen can not ever be downplayed. It's because of education that our Kashmiri Pandits not only survived, but are thriving globally. Picking up a gun kills both the aggressor as well as the victim. We must make Kashmir safe by protecting the, its borders. POK has been breeding ground for training militants and Pakistan used that space for killing our people. I would support India to reclaim POK, which is actually a part of Kashmir. Once POK is integrated with our Kashmir, Pakistan will not be able to use that soil as a breeding ground for militants. We must promote trade and engage people in becoming financially independent. And I'm talking about all Kashmiris. Moving forward, we ask citizens to create harmony and live within the confines of law. We must promote pluralism in the state so that all communities can live together as they did before the connivance of local government and Pakistani trained militants who created mayhem and forced Kashmiri Pandits to leave Kashmir. The simple and most important message that flows from this step is to foster peace and development as also to marginalize those who promote division and bolster a culture of rebellion. Once we do that, I think there'll be no looking back. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Zuchi, for, uh, for giving us you know, a, a very positive uh, uh, view of the situation and you know, what we can look forward to. Um, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we come to the end of this episode. Uh, on behalf of uh, Global Kashmiri Pandit Diaspora and I am Buddha, I wish to thank you all the distinguished panelists for joining our session. And thank you viewers for patiently attending our session. Until then, until next time, take care and Namaskar.